Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on difficult conversations and COVID-19. Uh, first of all, I would like to um, apologize for the little delay that we uh, got started with. Uh, we had uh, some technical issues this morning, but uh, everything's good. So now we can get uh, started. Um, so yeah, we're really happy uh, that you could join us and uh, we thank you for being here. Uh, this webinar is a part of a series of three sessions on the benefits of a respectful workplace during COVID-19. Uh, so I'm Melanie uh, Verabin and I will be your moderator today along with other team members. Uh, I'm the communications coordinator at ARESA, otherwise known as the Atlantic Region Association of Immigrant Serving Agencies. Um, I would like to acknowledge that I currently am in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and I'm grateful for the peace and friendship treaties. Uh, you're all joining us today from the traditional and unceded territories of the Biothek, Mi'kmaq, and Malisid peoples, as well as the homelands of the Innu and Inuit of Labrador. Uh, we recognize the ancestral and continued ties of indigenous peoples to the lands and waters in the region known as Atlantic Canada. Um, one thing that Eraser uh, does is that we develop and provide professional development sessions tailored to our members, you, uh, most current needs. And uh, like everyone else, COVID-19 has forced us to adapt and for the time being, We've transitioned all our capacity building activities online. And we're very fortunate today to have Michael Petipa as our facilitator. Um, he's the founder of Clear Resolutions Conflict Management Services and has held various roles within government. Michael also uh, holds several professional certifications in the areas of negotiation, conflict coaching, transformative justice, and instructional techniques. Uh, with over 25 years of experience in conflict resolution and mediation, he's the perfect expert for this webinar series, and we feel very fortunate to have him. So you, um, you're probably all familiar with Zoom by now, but there's still uh, a few housekeeping items that we'd like to uh, go through. Um, so Michael will be presenting in English and the slide deck on the screens will be in English. Um, however, a French version will be available shortly uh, through the chat box. Uh, if you need interpretation in one language or the other, uh, click on the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen and choose your preferred language. And if you're bilingual and you don't need interpretation in any language, just you, shouldn't, you can just, sorry, ignore this. Uh, during periods of discussions and questions, feel free to speak in your preferred language. Uh, be aware that there is one time when the interpretation feature will not be available, and that is when you'll be placed into breakout rooms uh, to work on an exercise in small groups, and that will happen later um, in the presentation. So there will be time for questions during the presentation, um, and you can use the chat box to leave your questions. Um, also, when you're not talking, if you could remember just to uh, stay on mute, it will help reduce background noise uh, during the presentation. So uh, on the screen here, you can see the icons that you probably know very well by now uh, to mute, unmute, or to turn your camera on and off. If you encounter technical issue, you can try to turn off your camera as it may improve your internet connection. Uh, you can also try to uh, leave the meeting and rejoin, sometimes that helps. And if it doesn't work, please leave a message in the chat box and we will do our best to help you. So now finally, uh, I'd like to kick things off, to kick things off uh, by welcoming uh, warmly um, Mike Petipa. Uh, Michael, Mike, over to you. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and to work with you. Um, I guess uh, the first thing we want to do is just talk a little bit, if you can maybe slide to the, the presentation objectives and I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we want to cover. So 
as, uh, as mentioned by Melanie, it, there's a three part series and uh, it's all about creating respectful workplaces. And this first session is going to be about uh, difficult conversations. And uh, then of course, respectful workplace. And at the end, about harassment, some of the formal processes, harassment, uh, sexual harassment, and what that looks like and, and what we can do to, to improve things. So really in the, uh, I'm just looking at the screen, it says overview, team dynamics. So these are the things that we'll be talking about. Um, the team dynamics, exploring difficult conversations, that's the first part, you know, what makes them difficult and uh, why are they difficult, what we can do, and uh, the impacts of avoidance. In other words, not having that conversation. A lot of people say, sorry, a lot of people say, um, well, you know, if you just leave it, it'll go away. And we'll, we'll talk about that more. Some tools for success, success, communication, and how to do effective feedback. So, um, I'm just gonna take one second. So, the team dynamics. How things have changed during COVID-19. So, I'm sure uh, I can speak for many of us that uh, the past year has been pretty tumultuous and a lot of things have changed. And many people are sitting waiting, well, when are things gonna go back to the way they were? I'm not so sure that they ever will. However, some things will return to the way they were, but many things won't, they'll, they'll continue to go forward. So we'll talk, uh, we need to talk about what's the new normal, because it looks like we're all in a new normal and trying to find a ways to normalize what's happening there. So Matthew. Um, so first part, um, one of the things that we probably need to do is to hit the reset button. And, and by that, I mean, we figure out, uh, how's the situation around us affecting ourselves and other people and trying to find a new way to respond and to ask ourselves, what can I do differently? Because what you see on the screen is the stuff that we're going to talk about over the course of the three uh, webinar series. Some of them we will dive into deeper a little later, but basically I've broken into three main categories here. Awareness. So the awareness has to do about ourselves because sometimes when we're in a time with a lot of change, we tend to take on a victim role as well. Why is this happening to me? And why can't things just be the way they always were? And sometimes we need to, uh, if we're going to be proactive, we have to think about, okay, so what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? Um, what, what are some of the uh, biases and attitudes and things that I hold important to me that maybe aren't so important that I perhaps need to revisit, rethink, and retool? So another part will be prevention. So that when we're talking about creating a respectful workplace, we need to think about how can we keep it from declining or stop the decline if it's going that way and how to improve. So things like communication is always at the heart of difficulties. And uh, in a book called Getting to Yes, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later, it talks about how even people that have been married, for example, my parents were married for 65 some years and had 12 children, blah, blah, blah. And they would have miscommunications, misunderstandings, and, and, and from time to time arguments all the time. So it shouldn't really be that shocking for us that we would come to a workplace and there's people that we work with from all over the place, very different linguistic profiles, social, religion, uh, ethnic, ethnicities. It doesn't mean there has to be conflict, but it means that that situation becomes ripe for a lot of misunderstandings, miscommunications, bias, and so on. And sometimes we need to check ourselves and say, is there a better way to communicate? And if there is, what's that look like? And how can we avoid these uh, comments that might be disrespectful, hurtful, or just basic misunderstandings or miscommunications? So 
communication is almost always at the heart of issues. Uh, I've been doing conflict resolution, mediation, facilitation for over 20 years. Plus, I grew up in a large family, and I can say from firsthand experience, and all the books that I've read validate this, that communication is always at the heart of a problem, be it a respectful workplace, a disagreement, a difficult conversation. So the best way to resolve it is with good two-way communication. And we're going to take a look at that today on where are some of the pitfalls and what can we do about them. And then, of course, the last is to contribute to better communication. And by that, I mean people often talk about communication in organizations as what people say to each other. And that is a huge part of it. The other part of communication, though, that's really important is what I call information dissemination. That I would describe as communication from top to bottom and from bottom to top. So important information like timelines, deadlines, roles, responsibilities, projects, just knowing what's going on in the organization, what's happening and what's coming down the pipe. And then the other part, of course, is the interpersonal communication. And that's how people talk to one another, how they intermingle, what messages they give and how they communicate. So those are uh, two subcategories of communication that I think are going to be important. So Matthew, if you would. So the other things you, uh, that seems to have changed is that normally teams go through uh, this a dynamic and those dynamics are forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. And, and there's a book by Bruce Tuckman on that. And that's the normal development pattern. And it's not linear. Sometimes that goes in a circular or uh, an evolving process because teams can be forming and storming. Now, are some of you familiar with, uh, oh, I guess I can't really ask that question. I'm assuming that most of you are familiar with some of these stages um, where a team first gets together, then people are a little bit cautious and they're looking around and trying to figure out, well, how's this dynamic going to work? Or if you're new to a workplace, you tend to observe. And then storming is where you start to get involved and people maybe agree or disagree and they start figuring out how are we going to work together. Norming is when they start to come to agreements and they start to work together. Performing is when things are going really well and everybody knows what the roles are. They feel that they're up to speed. Uh, the processes are working. And then, of course, performing can keep going to higher and higher levels. So uh, most workplaces want communication and the performance and their output to be going well. And adjourning, this is mostly either when a person's leaving, retiring, or if it's a project, sometimes teams are formed only for a project. And then at the end of the project, that team expires and people go back to where they were uh, seconded second from. So that would be the adjourning part. And there's even a process to that when people are letting go. You always see this on TV series, it's at the end of the series where people have this get together and they're all hugging and crying and you know, saying goodbye to one another and they talk about what a fantastic time they had working together and so on. So my main concern at this point is how has COVID-19 COVID impacted the teams? And I've put up there some things for you to think about before we go to the next stage. And many things that I've talked to colleagues and, and, and people that I've worked with, you can see the list of some of the things that they have felt have been huge changes and have been impacted. So the distance, the fear and the safety, what's it going to be like going back to the workplace? Distrust. We had a lot of misinformation about COVID. And so how do we get past that and rebuild that trust so that people coming in can trust each other's, can treat, trust the management team, the, the cleaning organizations, the organization as a whole to make sure that they're going to have the workplace set up in a way that's safe and disease free. And then of course, not everybody's back to the workplace, as you know, the whole aspect of inclusion, how do you feel as part of a team when there might only be a quarter, a third, or a half of the team there? Many people still from home. It's our, our, our norm and our realities have changed and shifted. So that also impacts the morale, the financial stability of people at home and the business. Communication, you can't just, uh, you know, look over your little divider there between the cubicles and 
chat with the person next door. Um, that whole process of communication individually as a team with, with the management team has shifted. So has the workload. Some responsibilities because of changes in the organization have happened. Processes have changed and they will probably change more and even schedules. So we've been impacted on, on many, many levels and that not only impacts the team dynamics, but us personally, as well as the organization. organization. So rather than stay uh, in, in the abyss of negativity all day and talk about what's not going well and how we're being impacted, at, uh, fairly soon we're gonna start turning that around and say, well, what, what are the issues? What can we do? What can each of us do and, and how can we rebuild the workplace to be a respectful, safe, and uh, productive environment. So, Matthew. So, what can managers do? So, just in general, I guess I'd like to, to mention that oftentimes people think, well, I can relate back to the, uh, the time period of my dad when he was in the workplace before he retired. And the expectations then are probably different than now. But it's not unusual for people to say, well, you know, that's all the manager's responsibility. Well, what can the managers do to help? Now, these are responses that I got from another group and I'm gonna put them out for your, for your thoughts. You know, they can rebuild trust. They can be available, communicate, listen. And I already talked about the interpersonal and the information dissemination so that they know what, what information are people not getting that perhaps they need. They can plan for the safety and of course, take action. So that if there's an issue or concern or things aren't going well, that they can't, don't ignore it, slough it off or hope that it fixes itself, they take action. Employees. Well, I think earlier I mentioned about how communication is really important. And, and one of the things is to ask questions when they're not, when things aren't clear. When we get to the difficult conversation part, there's always a couple of linchpins, I'll call them, that make things worse. One is to be, to make assumptions and act upon them. That could be way off base. That's why I suggest ask questions. I'd far rather, and, and having been a teacher, people have said to me years and years ago and, and constantly, there's no such thing as a stupid question. And I think it serves us well to go along with that assumptions. Despite the fact that I must admit I have a bit of a bias, I taught junior high school for four years. And I myself, when I was in junior high school, was one of these kids that would sit there and try and think of the stupidest question I could find to try and get the teacher upset. <laughs> So I'm not convinced there isn't such a thing as a stupid question. However, most people in the workplaces, if they're really struggling and they're asking a question, it might seem a little odd, but it's probably not stupid because if they don't get the right question, right answer, or if they don't get the help and direction they need, things could get substantially worse. So I really encourage people to ask questions or I use the phrase, when in doubt, check it out, which is always more helpful than assuming and going down the wrong path. So of course we need some flexibility. I'm pretty certain that most, pretty certain that most people are very familiar with the whole concept of flexibility by now, because it's been quite a, quite a ride for the past year. Have some patience. All of our requests, I think we all know that in the workplace now, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of things to address when people are coming back, a lot of concerns, issues, backlogs of works. We could go on all day talking about that. And uh, we have to have a little patience because anyone, uh, any manager or supervisor is probably going to be inundated with a lot of requests. So it might take a little time, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't raise our concerns and let them be known. Whether that be one-on-one -on -one by sending an email, a text, or whatever the case may be. And the other, of course, is to take the time to listen. It's a very, very powerful communication tool. And, uh, it reminds me of a poem that was in my grade three reader. And I know I talk about my memory not being good, but there's certain things I do remember. 
And it goes something like this, and I'll just leave it with you to, to think about. It says, a wise old owl sat on an oak. The more it saw, the less it spoke. The less it spoke, the more it heard. So why can't we be like that wise old bird? So, Matthew? Uh, thank you. Oh, we're going back to the poll. So, poll. Uh, can we perhaps go back? Yeah, here we are. Here's the poll. So, folks, if you would be so kind as to choose a response, and then uh, we're going to see where you're at. So, it says, indicate which type of conversation. So, all that being said, when, when I said communicate, it's about, it's really important to communicate, especially when things are a bit uncomfortable. It's the only way they'll get addressed. So, We'll do this and then I'll, I'll elaborate on that a bit. So indicate which type of conversation you find the most challenging. Is it about performance reviews, dealing with offensive behavior, addressing favoritism, someone that's not being a team player, a personality conflict, or it could be something else that happens in the workplace. Um, uh, and of course, dealing with offensive behavior would include discrimination, racism, anything that's really inappropriate that makes you uncomfortable or other. So, we can probably give them a few more seconds and then uh, see what the results come up with. Mike, I just uh, shared the result here on your screen. Okay. All right. Well, that's helpful. So the one that uh, seems the group finds most challenging is uh, dealing with the personality conflicts and then uh, dealing with offensive behavior. And there was one for performance reviews. That's helpful. Um, okay. We can go to the next part if you would. So, so here is also a list when I've asked other groups in, 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 uh, in conflict what were difficult conversations for them. And as you can see by what's listed up there, there's many different things that people find difficult. So, um, there's two ways, two philosophies for approaching this. One is some people suggest you need to get comfortable with the discomfort. In other words, that's normalize, adapt, and accept to what's happening around you and be comfortable with it. Another approach is to become uncomfortable with what, ha with what has become comfortable. In other words, sometimes people live in bad relationships at home or, you know, there's crazy stuff going on around them. And uh, at some point, if a person wants to change, they need to say, okay, I need to be less afraid of the devil I don't know than the devil I do because this is not working and I need to get uncomfortable with what I've been comfortable with and then start to address it. So it's kind of a, a confusing uh, scenario, but the long and short is if it's not working, perhaps it's time to address it and have that conversation to try and get things on track or make it better. So you can see that uh, uh, in this list, people talked about giving feedback. Um, 
And that's not just on performance reviews, but giving feedback to people on behavior that's inappropriate. How do you address that without hurting their feelings and so on? Or some people say, well, I have a hard time admitting fault or taking responsibility or apologizing, especially if they feel that, you know, the other person started it or maybe they've said some things that were hurtful and they were responding and felt justified. But at some point we need to find a way to address these conversations in a way that's not confrontational, not vindictive, but more helpful. And I call that creating a learning conversation. So we're gonna to come to that fairly soon. So Matthew. So what makes conversations difficult? So these are the things that most people say make them difficult. And we've got two, uh, two diapositive, uh, two, uh, well, two of these uh, PowerPoints on that. So oftentimes people find trust. If you trust the person that you're going to have this conversation with, that they're not going to be judgmental or freak out, then it's easier to approach them. Previous experience, that can go either way. If you know the person, then it, and you've had good conversations, it makes it easier to approach. By the same token, both trust and previous experience, if it was a bad experience and you don't trust the person, then you're not gonna feel comfortable approaching them. Level of supervisory experience. Supervisors that are fairly new tend to be a little more reluctant to wade into situations that need to be addressed. Likewise, sometimes people go to a, are reluctant to go to a new supervisor because they feel they may not really be aware of the environment or have the experience and so on. Um, assumptions, reputation. I think I've mentioned earlier assumptions. Those are, are make things very difficult because we tend to take hearsay or some things that we've seen make opinions and judgments about them and then feel that they are the truth. Well, sometimes our assumptions are nothing more than just wild guesses. Sometimes they're very intuitive and they give us insight. But the only way to really know for sure is to go to the source. I call the person that we're in difficulty with the textbook. We need to go to the textbook and ask them, okay, here's what I'm seeing, and this is how it's impacting me. Where are you at? Did I misunderstand? What are you really thinking? What were your intentions? And that becomes a far better avenue to resolve than making assumptions and acting upon them because that can make the situation much worse. And of course, sometimes people don't like to go into difficult conversations because they're afraid it's gonna make it worse or that the person, if they don't get the outcome they're looking for, they might retaliate. Now, the number one thing with difficult conversations is a lot of people just avoid having them, assuming that it will go away. And in the years that I've been doing this, I think I found uh, a lot of evidence that suggests that's not the case. Situations often fester and get worse and then a person ends up leaving or being fired or gets into a formal scenario where it gets much, much, much more uh, adversarial. So dealing with things early and finding a way to approach and discuss things in a, in a helpful way seems to be over the past number of years, the most effective way of handling it. So part of that also is that oftentimes people are reluctant because of their own hot buttons. And sometimes somebody else's, we don't know what they've been through or what they may be comfortable or uncomfortable with. So we need to be careful of not hitting one of these hot buttons, especially if they're, and emotions oftentimes play into that hot button. So when person insults us or says something to us that's offensive or insulting, it's easy for us to react as upon to respond and think, is this really about me? Or is this really about them, their assumptions? Maybe they're having a bad day and I'm the target. Don't know. So these are the things that tend to make them more complicated. 
All right, Matthew. So now, were there any questions so far on this? I seem to have lost my touch with Solange. Our, I'll check. Yes, Mike, we have one. Yeah, oh. we have one. I'm sorry. And that is, what models of rebuilding trust have you found most helpful? Okay. Well, there's several models of having trust, and I think, I'm pretty sure I've got one a little later, but I'll go to it now. The things about, the things they've read about uh, rebuilding trust have a lot to do with accessibility, approachability, and honesty. And it's interesting, many of them are kind of like the chicken or the egg. So when we're rebuilding trust, for example, if you're in the management team, making sure that things are safe, clean, that you're giving all the information to people and answering their questions. And especially if you're asked the questions you don't know the answer, I come from an era where they say, you know, just give them any information, but don't ever say you don't know because then you lose, uh, you lose their confidence and you lose their respect. I found in the past two decades that has changed where people, especially younger people, um, say, you know, if you lie to me, then I've lost all my trust and I'm not going to believe you anymore. Actually, I learned that from my grade five class when I used to teach elementary school they see things very much as they are. If you promise them something and don't deliver, then you have no credibility with them. And it takes a long time to build it back. But if you say something and you follow up, then they will trust you and they will tell you things. So I would say the most important part of rebuilding trust is to have an open door, to be accessible, talk to people, and make them know that you are approachable in both how you respond, but most importantly, how you listen. And listen to hear what they're telling you and then respond accordingly. And show a willingness to work with them instead of freaking out, jumping to conclusions, running around and making a big issue, but maintain your confidentiality, listening very carefully, and then working with you to try and resolve it. So those are probably the most important aspects of any model of rebuilding trust that you'll find. I hope that answers your question. So any others at the moment that I can? Okay. So we'll move forward. Defining difficult conversation, what makes them difficult? So again, outcome can be important because if it's a very important uh, conversation that may be precedent setting or that may be face saving or it may impact a person's career, um, those become more challenging and they may involve more people. So those can make it difficult if there's a disagreement between the parties, or if there's a strong emotional content, that can be very difficult. Now, today we're gonna to touch on some of these things, but we're not going to go into, well, how would you address each one and what would be the step-by-step -step process? Now, that's because dealing with difficult conversations, uh, typically I deliver in a three full days in person, and we do a lot of interactive activities and so on. But what I'm going to give you is the high level stuff. Um, Really diving deeply on these would take quite a bit of time, but at least we're gonna hit the high points. So if there's disagreement between the party. If there's strong emotional content, my best advice is there are many different ways of dealing with emotions, especially your own, where you can either think about things, do some reflection or use a sounding board. And we may check on that later so that you're getting different perspectives, you're talking it out, you're hearing yourself, you're venting some of your frustration before you go into the conversation. Because clearly, timing 
also goes along with that. If you walk into the boss's office and you're really super upset about something and you start ranting, that may not be the most helpful approach. So, but it's difficult to not want to go in and say something when you're upset. So finding ways to deal with the emotion, bring it down to a level that's helpful. And most of the stuff is common sense that all of you probably know already. So other things that make it difficult, job performance. Well, our careers, our families, our values, our ethics are very important to us. And when things hit those values, they can have an emotional impact or they can have such a level of importance that it creates anxiety and perhaps uh, tension with us. And that will often affect what we say and how we say it, which of course then has a ripple effect on the conversation and the outcome. So, um, the, the last thing, discomfort, I think I already talked about that to some degree is that we need to recognize our discomfort is telling us something. Either we need to get more comfortable with it and figure out what it is, or perhaps it's time to make a change. Um, okay, Matthew. Ah, consequences of avoidance. Here we are. So what I'd like to do is take you through a small little activity about what are the consequences of not having those difficult conversations? Or basically put, what's the consequences of not dealing with an issue when it really should be dealt with? So what happens if you don't have the conversation? Who will know who will care and what difference will it make? Because often people ask themselves that question, trying to rationalize that, you know what, no one's going to care. It's not going to make a difference. So I'm just going to say nothing. And a person once recently sent me an email and it says, you know, when you don't speak up to try and keep the peace, you often create a war within yourself. And when we think about that, it's because then we start feeling guilty. Well, things have gotten worse and maybe I could have said something or maybe they would have changed their mind or I'm unhappy, but I'm doing it, although I don't agree with it. And we end up with a lot of inter turmoil and sometimes conflicts of interest that create stress and anxiety for us. And then we lose sleep and so on. So really when people often say, instead of saying, well, I, they, they will say something like, well, I didn't say anything because I was trying to be nice. And sometimes I struggle with that a bit because if the situation needs to be addressed and it's harming people about you, then not doing anything, I would have to question or I'll ask you, is that really being nice? Or is that just avoiding? So I'll leave that for you to consider while we go to the next part, because we're going to do this little exercise. So I believe uh, the, this, this wonderful team has you divided up into groups to do this small group exercise and you'll have four minutes. So in this exercise, you know, you'll be in a breakout room. And what I'd like you to do is just make a list and somebody in the group or you in the group can take turns when it's time to present. But I'd like you to make a list so that you're prepared to share it with the other groups when we come back to the main, the main screen. So here are the questions. The impact of non-action. What is the impact of not engaging in a difficult conversation or addressing an issue? What's that, and group one will discuss and make a list of at least five things of, what's the impact on individuals in the workplace when those issues are not addressed? Group two. What's the impact on the supervisor or the manager if the conflict or the situation is not addressed? Group three, the impact on the team as a whole. Sometimes there's small work teams. The fourth group, impact on the organization as a whole. And then the last group, what about the others? What about families, clients, and society? How are they impacted if you're not dealing with these difficult conversations or, you know, conflict situations within your workspace. So are there 
If there's any questions on that, you can send them through chat right away. If not, I believe I'm going to be put into co-host for a few minutes so I can just pop into each room quickly. So if you have a question, you can ask me. But then I'm going to just get out of your way, let you do your work so that you can present to each other and we'll start the learning together. Okay, are we ready to? So I guess we'll need somebody from group one, the impact on the individuals, to perhaps uh, bring themselves onto the video and uh, perhaps share with us what uh, your group has come up with, please. think I may have been made de facto leader, so, <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll take a go at it. So our group had a really robust discussion, and I think we came to the conclusion that there are a lot of different impacts that might result. Mm -hmm. um, so stress, continued stress by not dealing with the situation, a missed opportunity for learning and growth um, in having that conversation, continued low morale, potentially performance issues continue if you haven't had an opportunity to openly explore those with, um, with somebody else, not respecting, uh, or sorry, not building respect and understanding because sometimes having those difficult conversations allows you to do that with the other person or people. Um, we also said that um, there would be an increased likelihood of making assumptions by not having that conversation because you're not getting to the root of some things. Um, it could erode trust and it could also decrease motivation. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so how about someone from group two? Okay. Hi everyone. So we looked at it from two different ways. So one is um, if um, difficult conversations are not being brought to the supervisor and then if the supervisor themselves are not engaging in those particular difficult conversations. So um, one of the impacts that we talked a little bit about if things are not being brought to the supervisor was issues such as uh, team morale. Uh, we talked quite a bit about how often um, the supervisor is brought into a situation where it's almost too late to solve. Um, it's kind of grown to, to such an exponential point that if we had been brought in earlier, uh, we could have done a preventative approach versus reacting to the situation at hand um, and that it can have a larger trickle down effect within the team itself. So we could last, um, have, have frustrations and um, situations that arise that may be very difficult to, uh, to kind of solve and rebuild uh, afterwards. We discussed a little bit in terms of as a supervisor for avoiding difficult conversations is um, a feeling of incompetence that you're you're not actually doing the job that you are hired to do and expected to do, um, and just the the larger erosion of trust within the team itself. So the team will start trusting you less um, in regards to not again that perception that you're not doing your job, but also in the fact that uh, you're just not having those conversations that you're expected to be having and the expectation that you may not have those when are when they're particularly required. Thank you, Josh. Well done. How about group three? I was trying to find the unmute. I know we've got a lot of background noise. We didn't know we'd have to uh, <laughs> be uh, presenting. Sorry about that. Um, so we talked in terms of impact on the team. Uh, a lot of them have already been mentioned, and I, I think that makes sense because they, they tend to, uh, the negative impact of not having those conversations do tend to grow larger over time, and they can impact more people. So we talked about stress on the team, if they see that there are problems that aren't being dealt with. We talked about the snowball effect so that if things are not dealt with, then addition, then it can also grow to encompass other team members who end up getting involved. Um, we talked about um, if it's not being dealt with, then team members may try dealing with it on their own and that may not be the way that the organization or the supervisor would want it dealt with. Um, and so that may not align with, with ideally uh, what the team would be looking for in terms of outcomes. Uh, what else do we have? 
Okay. Very okay. good. All right. Thank you. And we on to team four now. Uh, so team four looked into the organization impact on the organization and as everybody before <laughs> mentioned this is just snowball effect where the organization is impacted in terms of the morale of the whole organization and staff and once um, uh, let's up one team is not performing because of that snowball effect and uh, everybody is affected uh, the organization on the organizational level uh, uh, the approach and program outcomes are also affected um, uh, dynamic of the whole organization can be affected um, because some other teams might need to um, uh, compensate and do uh, things that uh, one team did not complete. Um, yeah, so basically it just create more conflict and instead of dealing with one, you would need to deal with multiple. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's kind of like urban spread where it just keeps going. Yes. That, and that snowball effect. Okay. Exactly. Anything else to add this time? Uh, organize, kind of like a, a, yes, it feels that organization is losing control maybe over, yeah, yeah situations, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, how about group five? Hi, everybody, sorry, double muted, apologize. Um, with the piece in terms of uh, impact on others, a lot of the same uh, things that have been stated in the other areas, you know, in terms of um, adding additional stress. But in terms of coming into others, such as in particular family, uh, often if you are stressed with this area or not dealing with those difficult conversations, you could be bringing that home, effective of the communication that you're having with those around you, uh, your direct family members, potentially not being present in those conversations or in the work that you're doing, so less productivity. Um, potentially having mixed messages of what the work environment is like, what the programs are, um, in terms of that development. So there could be a misconception even with clients of, you know, what is uh, that program and being part of, or also in terms of, you know, how is that being delivered? How is that you know, effectively um, something that they should be partaking in? Um, also, in terms a little bit with uh, number four, with the impact of the organization, but ties in with this, is also the reputational damage that could be happening and the misconceptions uh, of what's going on based on someone's uh, perspective of that or what attitudes or conversations that they're having with regards to that. Um, it could uh, put at stake in terms of the relationships that you have with partners or with funders or other stakeholders within the community. Um, but also potentially affect uh, hiring practices. So who may be interested in uh, joining the organization, whether it's hiring as an employee or intending to join as a volunteer as well too. They may have their own misconceptions of what's going on because they're not getting the full picture of that piece. Excellent. Wow. Thank you. Thank you to all the groups. Uh, you've done a really good job of uh, basically summarizing pretty much all the things that I would have said so I'm glad that you had a chance to chat them and put them out there with your with your colleagues so I want to summarize very briefly that when you take a look at it from uh, perhaps uh, a balcony that what you're describing is that not dealing with these issues creates that festering ongoing and uh, you know it, it gets worse it just doesn't go away and you've raised some great issues. It goes from individual to team, that snowball effect. And I, and I did this uh, sequentially for a reason, from individual to supervisor to team to organization, and then out to the public and, and, and clients and society as well, because that's how a snowball works. It keeps getting bigger and it becomes more destructive as it goes. And so I just wanna highlight two things, and we're not gonna stay in this abyss of negativity all day, so the important thing to remember is that there's really two costs involved with not dealing with issues early. And the one is in the realm of human. So all the things that you said really boil down into both human and money. So the human impacts are the stress, the anxiety, 
people withdrawing, the fatigue, and even where people are calling in sick or they go on long-term leave, that means the people behind have more work and they become stressed so that when some are coming back, others are leaving, and that can become a self-perpetuating process. And then the other, of course, is money. And you've raised, if people get, or get, get disenchanted enough, they will leave the workplace and quit or find another job. So then you lose their knowledge, their experience, their expertise. And if it's a, a client-based organization, sometimes clients, and this, this is what I've learned from my six sisters. Um, and this is not meant to be a sexist comment. It's meant to be something that they have taught me that said, because us guys or some of us guys, okay, I'll, me, <laughs> I don't mind going to a place that's cost 10 bucks to get a haircut because, you know, I'm not really working with uh, uh, a Picasso anyway. Uh, whereas my sisters, I noticed, and they've talked about this openly, that they develop a relationship with their hairdresser. And if that hairdresser moves across town, it's not unusual for them to go over there and be clients at the new place they're at because they've known each other for a long time and they like what they do and they have this relationship and trust with them. So, so you can lose a lot of experience, knowledge, and clientele um, because of that breakdown in communication, that loss of respect. So, and that can uh, make it very difficult. And someone else mentioned the, uh, it's hard for an organization to hire good people and keep them if that reputation of being a, a, a crappy place to work precedes them. So, you know, there's both a financial loss, there's a human cost, and uh, this actually is very, very serious. And quite often though, some of these things fly below the radar. So I just kind of wanted to put that out for us to get a chance to verbalize. You know, there's a lot more to this than just saying, oh, well, Bob took my parking spot, so now we got to have this big issue. That's not where this comes from. It comes from stuff that can fester and grow and get bigger, and it can be very damaging to organizations. So I think what we need to do now is, uh, is go on to the impacts of non-action. And I think some of it will reflect what you've already said. And I thank you again for doing such a good job of that. So can we please go to the next, uh, yes, the next frame. So if it's a performance issue, that's gonna remain unresolved. And I think you've all talked about these things and that negative history is created that becomes the new norm. And I think the biggest thing is that the lack of trust is a two-way street. People, if they don't feel heard and they don't feel their managers and supervisors are listening to them and taking action, then they may feel let down and that can eventually turn to resentment. And vice versa, if the managers are trying to deal with or people aren't coming to talk to them, it's not unusual for people in the workplace to say, well, you know, the managers know darn well, how could they not know, you know, but they're just not doing anything in there, they don't care. And at that point is when we may forget that it may not be so evident because sometimes two colleagues can have an issue going on for quite a while that they keep between themselves and others may not notice. So unless somebody is bringing it to the attention of the managers, they may not know. And we have to work within the realm of, you know, our humanity that we don't always know everything all the time. At least I certainly don't. So, um, we, we want to stay on top of these things. And what would the next uh, frame be, please, Matthew? So it's not neutral. And, and when, I want, when I go to this, uh, and you can see all the things you said, team members become disgruntled, credibility goes down, trust. You've mentioned a lot of these things. But why I want to reiterate this is this. People often think it's, it's like the bystander. And I've had quite a bit of training on you know, the, the role of bystander, people say, well, if I don't say anything, then it's not my issue. Someone else can deal with this. Or if I don't say anything or if I don't do anything, then I'm not making it better and I'm not making it worse. So they think, well, that's neutral. So I put a few questions to you. Well, I'm going to ask you the questions and then probably answer them because we're not back and forth, but the long and short is, 
if you say nothing, is that really neutral? And I'll give you an example. You're walking down the street and a child falls in the river and is crying for help. If you don't respond and go dive in, is that neutral? Or have you actually taken away an opportunity? Have you not helped? Or let's say two kids are there and one fellow is and one person's bullying the other child. And you say, well, it's not my business. They're not my kids. I'm not even going to say anything. Is that neutral? Because some people say, well, let's go to the next step on that. If you're standing there watching one child beat up a smaller child, if that's the case, are you condoning the activity? Are you allowing it to take place? Are you seeing harm that's preventable that's happening and you're not making a difference? Then some people go the other way and say, yes, but if you intervene, then you're changing the natural dynamic between these two and who are you to establish what people should or shouldn't be doing or how they attempt. So that's the ongoing debate back and forth. But what I would suggest is no matter which side you go on or how you look at it, sometimes not doing something means condoning and almost giving permission and allowing it to happen. And if you do get involved, it may cause a change. However, if we take a look at our social responsibilities, there is a time and place when we can stop something that is destructive by what we say or what we do. So um, I just want to throw that out with the neutrality because I'm finding that some people look at that as a kind of a place to hide for non-activity or avoidance. And I guess I just want to put across that it still has an impact. It can be positive, it can be negative, but there is an impact. Just like when people say, well, if you don't make a decision, you can't make a bad decision or you can't make a good decision, it's neutral. I suggest it's not because deciding not to make a decision, from my perspective is in fact, you're making a decision to not make one. And that will have an impact. Just like the little child is getting beat up. If you don't do anything, that kid's going to get hurt. So I'm just throwing that out for your deliberation and for your thought process. Okay, so let's move forward if we shall. So here's the good news about difficult conversations. And uh, I can tell you now, we're not going to get to all of the communication things and go into them in verbatim and learn them and practice them. But we will touch upon the things that you need today. And again, if there's a need or a, a, an appetite for a deeper dive, I'm sure uh, I can have discussions with Carolyn and, and the powers to be about what that might look like. But here's the good news. So within your organization, you probably already have a great network set up where many of you confide with one another, whether you're employees, managers, or, or whatever the case may be. People that you respect already, that you know are, are, are good people and, and competent, and that you can turn to for advice or sounding boards. And the other good news is that how you handle the conversation will impact the outcome. So if, if a person finds themselves now having, trying to have conversations and they're not effective, then perhaps it's a matter of tweaking what one is saying or not saying, what you're doing, not doing, how you're approaching it. And there's lots of uh, really good, in fact, the book Difficult Conversations by Patton Stone has a tremendous amount of very helpful things on how to start a conversation, how to respond. And we'll touch on some of those as we move forward. But we can learn this. This is a very learnable skill, which is point number three. Um, I can only speak for myself. I was so shy as a teenager, I would never tell someone I was uncomfortable with what they were saying or doing. After, well, living another 40 years, uh, there's been lots of opportunities to realize that, you know, there are things I can say and ways I can say them or questions I can ask that can change the direction of those conversations or those behaviors. Okay. There are opportunities to practice. Most of us, in our everyday lives, uh, even if it's stuff that we can be using in the workplace, we can typically use it at home or in our social realms. 
because when we practice asking open-ended questions or using I messages and things of like that, we get better at them, we get more comfortable and they become more natural. So we can, here's another good point. We can shift our perceptions because often the whole thing with assumptions is we assume we know something, but when we stop assuming and judging and start listening, it's amazing what we can learn. And when we learn more information, it can definitely change the way we see things. This is why communication is such a key. Also, when we offer our insights to a person in a non-threatening way, they might go, hmm, I never thought of it that way. Or, well, that's an interesting point. I never would have thought or I haven't experienced it, but that's interesting. So that means if we develop an awareness of ourselves and the other person develop an awareness of themselves, it's already started to evolve and the conversation can evolve into a learning conversation, which is really what we want to make happen in difficult conversations instead of being confrontational. And typically people are trying to convince the other person that they're wrong and I'm right. When we let go of that and say, how is it that we can see things differently and become curious about that is when really a lot of good things happen. And that changes the ripple effect from a negative to a positive one. So those are high level things. And we're gonna go into a few of them very quickly. But again, we'll just talk about some of the skills that you might be need, you might already have, or that you may want to strengthen or learn more about going forward. So uh, we don't have any questions at this point, do we? Okay, so let's take a quick look at some of the tools for success. So the first, well, the three main categories here are preparation, communication skills, and then the tools themselves. So Matthew, if you would please. All right, once again, we're not gonna get into all of these today, but we'll go over them quickly. The first thing is take a look inside oneself. And I know people are saying, oh my, I didn't think this is gonna be one of those self-exploration, you know, self-actualization workshops. You know, we just wanna know how to fix that person over there so that they can be a better person because really the problem's not with me. And a lot of people feel that way. So that's part of the attitude check. First of all, am I contributing somehow? Like what's important to me and what am I looking for? Do I want a decision? Do I want an agreement? Do I want resolution? Am I trying to fix the problem or am I trying to fix them? These are very important questions to ask oneself before we go in. Why? Because they will dictate what we say, how we say it and what approach we take. And as we already established, how we approach these things has a huge impact on the outcome. Just like sprinters, you get a really good start, you're gonna do all right. You get off to a bad start, that's a big hole to dig out of. So the self-respect reflection, you know, am I gonna be a participant or am I going to be a victim? And sometimes we are victims. And sometimes recognizing that there may be something that we've contributed that could help us make a better decision next time can be very difficult to bring ourselves to think about. However, there may be an aspect of that to it. So when we, uh, and of course, using a sounding board, this can be very helpful when we, before we go into a conversation, and some of the things that it's helpful with are our ability to vent. So if we can have a friend that wants to listen to us for 20 minutes while we vent, that can get rid of a lot of those negative emotions so that we can then calm down, think more clearly, and approach it in a more cerebral and non-confrontational way. I often say, people often come to me uh, as a third party neutral and say, you know, I'm really upset with my boss about this or that or whatnot. And I feel like marching in their office and just tearing a strip off them. Well, there's some consequences to doing that. And it may not be the most effective approach. So if you can get that emotion under control and start asking yourself, so what am I really upset about? Is there a better way to put this on the table that the person can hear? 
And that's what the skills and the, and the approaches are all about. And so the first three, really when it comes to attitude are, I've already mentioned changing judgment to curiosity. Instead of going in there, telling a person how wrong they are, what they did was wrong and how damaging it was, is be curious about, so what were you thinking about or what was your intention? Or, you know, how did you get to where you are so that you can learn? Because sometimes when we learn, their explanation might make some sense. And the impact on us may very well have been accidental. We don't know. But unless we have that conversation, we can't just assume. Um, and here's, here's an example. I hear this all the time. People say, well, my boss hates me. They're out to get me for whatever the reason is because, you know, they correct my work. Well, maybe they correct everybody's work. I don't know. But unless you have the conversation, one isn't going to know. So blame versus contribution. Um, this is another really important thing. That means that when we're reflecting, doing our self-reflection, at some point after we finish, probably after we finish venting with a friend, and if the friend is hopeful to say, so contribution can be two things. And this is really important. It could be something that we do and shouldn't have done, or perhaps something that we haven't said or done, but could have. So that opens the door to more self-exploration. And people often, when they hear me talk about contribution, say, oh, so you're going to blame them or you're blaming me. If you ask me what was my contribution, you're blaming me. No, I'm saying there might not be blame at all. Typically, if there's a misunderstanding, both parties have either didn't hear or didn't explain it clearly, or there may be something you could have done, better instructions, or ask a question to clarify. So when we start to look at it as when two people are in a conversation, they both have a responsibility to say what they really think and feel in an honest, non-provocative way and share as much information as they can. And if we're not doing that, we may be holding back the process inadvertently. And of course, that means that instead of blaming, fighting, arguing, you're trying to convince the other person they're wrong, we're now in a learning conversation where we share with them what we think and feel. They share with us what they think and feel. And then both sides typically will get this revelation going, oh, that's not what I thought was happening, or I didn't know they felt that way. And the whole conversation changes. So that's kind of a high level explanation of how this all works. So let's go to uh, the next part is uh, the tools for communication. So the communication process, if we break it down very quickly, is fairly simple. And we're, I know we're running out of time, so I'll get to a few of these things. And many of them we can cover in the next workshop, but I'll just go through this quickly. So verifying, verifying that the intent and the understanding are the same. Now, who's responsible to verify whether the message is clear, the speaker or the listener? And now we're gonna have another poll where you can choose which of those you think is, is the most effective. So there's your choices. The speaker, the listener, both equally, or really nobody, because you told them once that should be enough. And here we are, both equally. Wow. Okay, we can, we can end the poll if you like. Uh, all right, so predominantly most people said both equally. And I'm going to add to that just briefly. Most people will assume that that means everybody is 50% responsible. So I'm gonna take that to another level and say, what if this was to happen? Um, is it possible to do a, a, a blank screen that I can, sorry. 
Yeah, a whiteboard. Here we are. I hope you can see this. Can everyone see this? Yes. All right. Well, actually, there's a part in here that stop sharing. Okay. Stop sharing. So here's the thing. This is supposed to be a box, but let's just make it. Okay, this is a really bad box. Clearly, I didn't do well in, in, in art in school. So people often say, well, if I take 50% and you take 50%, then we shouldn't have any issues with communication. But unfortunately, what may happen is, you know, and this even happens with couples. You know, well, I'll do these responsibilities and the other person says, well, I'll do these responsibilities. And if they don't check with each other, they end up taking the same half. So both of them are working on this part and this part doesn't get done. So someone suggested once, what if each party, the speaker and the listener takes 100% responsibility, then this changes because nothing falls through the cracks. And then they can have a conversation about how we're going to split those up evenly, and then they're both in the know. I know that seems rudimentary. However, it's interesting how that can play out, either in the workplace or privately. So I'm going to hit the stop share so we can go back to where we were. And I believe someone else has the uh, PowerPoints, or did I mess that up when I hit that button? Oh, awesome. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, so let's have a quick look at these tools. Um, if we could go forward to number 29, please. Okay, so here's the overview of the tools that you need. Listening, the use of silence, I messages, use of questioning, paraphrasing, and feedback. So those are the things that we typically use, and even in the professional realm as a mediator and facilitators, these are, our, these are our lifeline. And the better we get at using these, the better we can make sure that a conversation goes in a way that's going to be productive. So as I said, we really don't have time in an hour and a half to go through each one of these individually and practice them. But what I can say is that one of the most significant ones, and I put it first, is the listening. And the reason I say that is because we're not going to know when to be quiet and let someone speak. We're not going to know how to use an iMessage to respond or what questions to ask or even how to paraphrase what a person said if we're not listening. It's kind of common sense, isn't it? So it doesn't mean that all we ever have to do is listen and not use the rest, but clearly it is the segue into the effectiveness of all the others. And then feedback, uh, again, that's something where I, you know, because we were a little late getting going, I, I think we might need to leave that to the next one because I do integrate it into the, uh, into the creating a, a respectful workplace now, I guess what I would need to, you, need to know from you is that if there's any of these, if you're planning on taking the second workshop that we would like me to go into in more depth or take a little bit deeper dive, please indicate that on your evaluation form so that uh, I can plan that in there. So on the next, uh, next frame, uh, yeah, actually, if we can just skip to endings the next one uh yeah we'll keep going right until we hit 34 yeah that's good anchoring agreements so the interesting thing is at the end of a conversation especially if it's between like an employee and a supervisor it's probably a good idea i know if you're if there's a problem that really needs to be addressed 
most people in HR would suggest that there be some kind of a written memo or that you record it, the time, the date, the, the gist of the conversation. But even between, between two people that have an issue, they figure it out and they agree together, okay, let's do some things differently moving forward. It's a good idea to probably have that written down, even if it's just in an email so that you can send it to each other and say, okay, this is what I got from our discussion. This is what we're planning to do and who's going to do what. So that you have a common understanding of how you're moving forward. It becomes like an action plan. And they say things don't really get action until they're written down. And it serves us all very well in a couple of ways. Because first of all, everyone's on the same page. And what that really helps with is as time goes on, even in good agreements between people, people can start to misremember. Oh, was I supposed to do that or were you supposed to do that? Or if it went, if it's going badly, did we agree that we're gonna go to the manager or that we're gonna talk again or what? So it's a good idea to have even just a brief little memo written down, share it. Some people don't like email because they're gonna send it on. But if one is respecting confidentiality, you keep it between yourselves. So that if there's any questions in the future, you can go back to this and say, ah, okay, here's what we agreed to. And then there isn't going to be another argument. You pick up where you left off, you deal with what's popping up and, and away you go. Okay. So, uh, I think that's about it or the next one anchoring agreements in case I've missed something. Yes. So, and if it's a top-down conversation, putting in the agreement or our action plan, it's important to have a forward-focused process. This builds trust, communication, and clarity. So that, yes, you mentioned the, you have to talk about what the issue was and term it in, here's what we've agreed to, what's going to happen in the future, how we're going to address it, what's going to be better, what each of us is going to do, set clear goals that are measurable and consistent, and then decide on follow-up. How often do we need to meet? Or do we need to meet once, twice, once a week for a month? Write that stuff down so that you can refer back to it and you can be consistent. And the more reminders we have for consistency, the more consistent we become as employees and managers and the better that happens, especially in time of COVID where people's all over the place and things are all over the place to have something that's consistent and stable that we can refer to can give people a real sense of security of, uh, of, of, of being included and respect, which are the things that I believe are very important in every workplace. They say everybody needs air, acceptance, inclusion, and respect. And by having these conversations in a respectful way to deal with issues that are plaguing us, that's one of the very important places where each and every one of us can contribute to a better, more respectful, and more invigorated workplace. Even during and after COVID, those are some things that are universal. And I guess the next one will be the references. So the next frame, I think, please, Beth. yes. So here's some books that I've suggested and that can be helpful. Um, Difficult Conversations by Patton and Stone. Getting to yes, if you wanna know about mediation, facilitation, and really how to uh, deal with almost any type of an issue, that second one, Getting to Yes by Fisher and, and, and Uri is one of the best I've read. Um, this will help managers and uh, the, the five stages of team development by Tuckman and the four horsemen of the relationship apocalypse. Anybody can read that, that's kind of interesting. And Who Moved My Cheese is, uh, it's kind of done almost, and, and there's a video that comes with it or you can get a video with it that's a, a cartoon type video. It's it's interesting, but it's more about adapting to change and the challenges with come with change and how we can retool our own attitudes and perspectives to be more effective in, in times of great change. And so it is kind of intended to be a little bit 
entertaining, but there are some good messages and it's fairly short. I think I read that book on one plane ride. So anyway, that's what I have for now. And I'm looking forward to meeting with you again and maybe taking a deeper dive on some of those issues. So I apologize for the inconsistency in the timing, but I hope that uh, you've, uh, uh, well, I'm gonna turn it over now to the other folks. So there is a learning journal, I believe. Yeah. And that really is questions for you to ask yourselves and maybe take note of you know, what have you learned? What are the strengths that you have already? And what are some of the things you might want to work on? And now when you go back to the workplace, what's something that you can help do to make it more respectful? Is there a difficult conversation that you've been putting off and putting off that either A, you might want to try and have, or B, that you might want to soundboard with someone or get a little bit more direction or help on how to address that and make it go well. And then of course, the evaluation, I think Melanie and the crew was going to do that. And I wanna thank you all for coming, for your involvement. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed the session and are looking forward as I am to uh, diving deeper in some more of these things and talking about how we can work collectively to really bounce back from the COVID and make our workplaces safe, respectful places that really we all want to have. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, that was great. I think it was a really rich presentation and uh, I'm sure we will all leave the meeting today with a, a toolbox that we'll be able to use whenever we're faced with difficult conversations and um, going more in depth. Uh, we'll all look forward to go more in depth at the next uh, sessions. Thank you all for participating today. Um, and in a few minutes, you'll receive an evaluation form by email. And if you could uh, please take five minutes to uh, answer the survey, that would be great. That would be highly appreciated. Uh, we will see you in two weeks for part two of the series, and that would be on November 17. So thanks again, everyone, uh, and uh, see you next time. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you.